Hello everybody, my name is Jess Haig. I'm a librarian um, at a university in the UK and today I'm going to uh, show you the presentation that I did for a group of pre-service um, lifelong learning tutors and teachers. So these are trainee teachers going to work in the lifelong learning or FE or vocational sector uh, and they haven't started working yet and this is a presentation I did for them. But this sort of thing would apply to anyone who was ever working in education, teaching, training, uh, facilitating, anything like that because I think information skills and information literacy is something that crosses all sectors and all ages and something that trainee teachers need to be aware of and also need to be more conscious of um, implementing in their own lessons and their own facilitation. So today I'm going to go through this presentation. Now during this workshop um, I also included some activities so obviously I can't do that because it's a YouTube video but if you'd like to um, do some activities during this I'm going to describe what they did and if you want to do them yourself maybe have a little bit of a think about them and if you want to communicate me in the comments underneath um, I'm more than happy to talk about, about things that you, you come up with. I think it's a good way of being a little bit more interactive so if you want to do that please feel free. If you have any questions or comments please do get in touch and um, as ever uh, these are my opinions not necessarily the pins of my institution I am representing myself. So just to start off, this workshop will be exploring what information skills are, why as teachers um, you should be promoting them, um, both as a separate subject separately and within your own lessons, and also how to recognise the importance of information literacy in general at, to yourselves and to your students. So first of all, um, I just want to say that there are many, many definitions of information literacy um, and these are available from SILIP, which is the UK uh, main library body, and other library bodies, uh, the American Library Institution Association, excuse me, um, has released uh, a couple of years ago something from the American College and Research Libraries uh, group, uh, released a framework um, of information literacy objectives or ideas or threshold concepts. Uh, there's loads. There's, you speak to a different librarian, they will have a different definition of what information literacy is. But as a rule, I think that this one that I've put on the slide, when you can recognise when information is needed and have the ability to locate, evaluate and use effectively that needed information, kind of as a coverall, is quite a good sum up. Um, it's about how you, how you deal with the world around us. And, and what it throws at you and what how you respond to it really. It was first conceptualised in the 1980s. Uh, there are some arguments that um, it is otherwise defunct librarians trying to find a place for themselves within the curriculum. Um, but I think that given the rise of the information society and the prevalence of poor or biased information sources in the lives of our students, and this is coming up more and more the more you work in education, you'll see that students are using information that they haven't evaluated, they haven't really thought about, and teachers are using information that they haven't processed themselves. So I think it's growing in importance that all educationalists are aware of information literacy skills needed to be affected finders, users and producers of information because it's not just about what you find and what you use yourselves in your lessons and your citing of the sources. It's also about you as an information producer and creator of information content and this could be online, this could be in your lessons. And if you do not have the skills to know when, to, where and when to appropriately produce and create and upload information about yourself and um, in general, then you're not going to be a functioning member of the information society in the future. So that's something that, again, teachers need to recognise and impart to their students. So um, this next slide, um, I, I, I can't tell you what the information world is going to be like in the future, I don't think anybody can. Uh, this um, is taken from Mackie and Jacobson, who are two American librarians who wrote a book on meta-literacy um, that's um, shaped the framework of um, threshold concepts that the uh, ARLCL published um, themselves. So these are some skills that meta-literate students... Now, the idea, as I understand meta-literacy, and I am no by means an expert, is it's the concept of taking various literacies and merging them together to become a well-rounded um, person who can contribute and collaborate and exist, basically, in, in the information world. So it's things like understanding context of online sources, knowing copyright law. Copyright law is such a minefield. It varies from country to country. How to license original and repurpose work through Creative Commons, be aware of digital footprint, 
participate responsibly and ethically in sharing information, the list goes on. So in the future, information literacy is always evolving. It's all, there's always a new skill to gain. As educationists, we have to be aware that the needs of our students now will be very different to the needs of the students in five years' time. And that's not a very long time in teaching. So you've got to be constantly upping your game and finding out what's new, what, what do we need to be up on, what do we need to know about. And also, that's something that our students need to be aware of, because a student who's 11, who thinks they know everything about the internet, in five years' time when they're doing the GCSEs, is going to have a very different world to work in. And one thing I will say is that there is no such thing as a digital native. There is a common misconception that young people, or people even you know, my age, from the early 30s under, um, know everything about technology and know everything about using the internet and are brilliant and don't need any training whatsoever because they know everything. This phrase digital natives um, gets seen an awful lot. It is rubbish. It, there is no way that you can be suddenly born into a generation and therefore know everything about the technologies that are apparent within that generation. It, divide, it depends entirely on your circumstances as to how much experience or knowledge or even interest you have have in using technology. There is an assumption that young people are technical pro proficient in using information sources, but that doesn't necessarily mean they have the skills in finding, producing and using the information that teachers expect. Um, the quote I've put on the laptop here, school students adopt a default attitude of trust and are relatively unquestioning when using information sources. That is from a report I've put all of my um, references at the back of the end of this uh, presentation so if you want to check them in and I will put them in underneath as well. So teachers may think that their students will know what they're doing, they don't necessarily know what they're doing or they may have an assumption that they themselves know what they're doing but they actually do not. So don't go into a classroom blind thinking that oh my students know how to use a, a mouse, they, they know how to code, they know how to uh, go on social media and find everything they need. They no, not necessarily, especially with social media, because it's the sort of thing that, that, that affects people's lives in such a pervasive way. It may be an unhealthy way that they are learning about the world. So that's something, again, as teachers, you need to be aware of the outside influences of your students' learning in order to either counteract them or to defend them. So let's look at the actual digital fluency of teenagers. Now this is from 2011 and that was five years ago and things changed in five years. But this research showed that many young people were not careful discerning users of the internet, unable to find information they were looking for. They trust the first things they do find. Myself, I've worked in FE, um, working with, with um, teenagers from 16 onwards and young adults. And now I work in a university and I would say that, yeah, 80% of students I met, first thing they did was go on Google because quite a lot of them believe that the internet is run by Google or Facebook um, and type in a question as uh, if it's Ask Jeeves and the first hit, the first three hits, they believe it unquestioningly, will copy and paste it, don't believe in plagiarism, don't understand how it works and I, from my experience that's that's the norm. I'm not saying that's the same for all young people, I'm just saying that that's something that I've experienced myself as an educator. I also think that students are unable to recognise bias and propaganda because they don't understand how it works. So things like not understanding who owns newspapers, who owns websites, where they get their revenue from what their interests are. Students sometimes have, have no concept of that. I don't think teachers sometimes have any concept of that. I don't think most people in the world have any concept of that. That's something that worries me. And it makes you vulnerable if you don't know who is providing your information, who is telling you what to think, how to dress, what to buy, what to read, how to vote, what football team to support. If you don't understand their... their um, goals in doing that, what, what their aims are in, in, in telling you these things, then you are vulnerable to being exploited. Inaccurate content, online misinformation and conspiracy theories are appearing in the classroom. This has been reported to be by several tutors at the university that students are repeating conspiracy theories. Again, something that would have been laughed out the room 20 years ago when I was at, at university is now considered fact by students. So why is this important? Well, 
think about the impact of information on your life. This, again, this quote is from 2008, it's a little bit old, but it's still valid. Information and where we search and what we listen to not only impacts our views of the world, but directly impacts who you are, who you are as a person. So if you think of yourself as standing on a mountain of information, everything you've read, listened to, watched, everything you've heard, that stands underneath you and that gives you a different viewpoint to somebody else whose information mountain is made up of very different things. We're all the same, we just have heard and listened to and learnt different things. So the first exercise I did is a little bit of a think pair share. This is where you think of something and uh, for a few minutes and then you talked about it with the person next to you and then you maybe share your findings with the class. So think about something you've read or heard or watched and think about the way it you thought about something or influenced who you are in a major way. So think about maybe something you've read or maybe, I don't know, a, t a YouTube video you've listened to or watched. I know quite a lot of people who've watched TED Talks and how influential they can be. And think about the way that they that changed how you thought about something or influenced who you are. Just think about that for a moment. I, 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 I might share one of mine. Um, I. I grew up um, in quite a liberal lefty household, um, but I think one of the major influences in my life was probably reading some of like the uh, the older feminist, second wave feminist ch tomes uh, in my teenage years, reading Marilyn French's The Woman's Room, things like that, and that gave me a certain outlook on the world, but then in the last five years I've started following a lot of people on Twitter, I've been reading more feminist blogs and it's given me a different view of feminism and different view of how men and women treat each other and how uh, the, what the patriarchy is and all that sort of thing so the way that I've learned about something that I'm interested in has changed over the years because of the different kinds of information sources that have come available to me the different viewpoints that have been shared and also the value I've put on those so when I was 14 a book a book that I could held in my hand that my mother gave me was probably one of my most trusted sources of information I never looked at what the author was or the political viewpoint I never really thought about different parts of of the text and how they made me feel so now I, I base an awful lot more of, of who I am on, on what I learn about other people's lived experiences or what other people from around the world tell me about how certain things affected them. I, I look about things a little bit more objectively I think and I also read an awful lot wider than I did when I was 14 because I have access to the internet now. I didn't when I was 14 or if I did I had very very little of it. So I think that now because of the amount of information I can now access my viewpoint is widened. That's not necessarily the same for everyone. Some people it's narrowed because they have access to more information but they're not critically appraising or evaluating that information when they get it. So have a little think about how information has changed your life, but then consider if that's something that's influenced or changed you as a person, how much it must it do for your students in your class? And how much can you, as a teacher or an educator or a facilitator, how much can you influence the way somebody is? Think about when you were at school and the teachers that gave you the books that changed who you were. I'm sure that some of you will have thought in that exercise of a teacher who gave you a book, maybe a fiction book that changed you. Somebody will Children's books especially can have a real big impact on who, who people are when they're adults and their values. So think about what, what influence you can have on your students and who they become and how they experience information. So now I'm going to share with you um, some of the things we do as librarians um, information literacy exercises that we do to try and get people to think a little bit more critically about the information they consume and produce. So this is called the crap test. It's it's a really popular thing. It started in America years ago. If you Google C-A-R W-A-P you will find so much, so many resources, YouTube videos, dreadful, dreadful YouTube songs. I'm going to put some links on this to the songs if you want to have a look at those. I love them, I think they're hilarious, but I, whether or not they, they do actually any educational value, I'm not really sure. Um, so this is a leaflet that was produced by institution. I'm producing this in here because I think it's quite a, a, a well-rounded and, and comprehensive leaflet. This does not mean that my institution is, is sponsoring this video at all. Um, but if you look at the letters and what they stand for, I've done videos previously on the on the different letters of the crap test and what they stand for, so please do have a look at those. But 
as an example that I would show to the class, I might go to a website. I, I give everyone in the class a, a copy of this leaflet, and I might go to a website. So the website I usually go to for this is called coolmathforkids.com, and um, it's an American website that gives teachers um, different exercises to do with students. Uh, it, it's quite funky looking. Uh, but as an exercise in evaluating the information, it's great because it's written by somebody called Cool Math Karen, um, and you can't really have any authority of who she is or if it's a her or if it's a company or why the website exists. Another example that I would say is Google Learning Theories. Now, Learning Theories is something that a lot of education students are interested in and look up and have to write reams and reams on. If you're a teacher or a trainee teacher, I'm sure you'll be groaning inwardly at that. If you Google Learning Theories, from my experience, when I Google it, and bearing in mind Google changes for everybody because it remembers what you what you type into its box and, and, and adjusts its findings according to how much money it can make off you, well, how much money the people who give it money can make off you. If you Google learning theories, the first thing that comes up in my experience is a website that is pointing to try and sell you a book. It's not written by anyone of authority. It sums up various learning theories without referencing. It's worse than Wikipedia in terms of referencing poor information. Um, I would um, discard it completely. And I usually use that as an example of why you shouldn't just Google stuff um, in order to find out things, but you should think a little bit more carefully about how you find and access information. Um, I also talk a little bit about how they can implement the crap test in their lessons. So things like putting the numbers on a dice, I've seen that done before. Turn it into a card game, I've seen that done before at a conference last year with the librarian conference and I thought that was a really good idea. There are loads of different ways you can incorporate this. So what I've done here is an example where I've given them a couple of sources to go through to do a crap test on, but also ask them to think about how would they do this in their lesson, would they do this in their lesson, what resources would be appropriate to use with this your learners, so if you're an FE tutor, what sources would, do you think your students would go to primarily and how could you maybe use them. Um, I, I as a massive lefty, tend to go straight to things like the Daily Mail because it's an easy target, but... Um, any, any large corporate body of information is a good one in order to, to use. Also, talk about things, the difference between open access information and uh, paywalled. So I talk a little bit about how the stuff that they can access from the library is different from the stuff that they can access if they don't have access to HE library resources and the difference between the two and the gulf between the two. So talk about how um, their students at FE colleges will not have the same access to information as students say are doing A-levels or students doing um, a foundation degrees because their information sources, the, the institutions that they do, they go to to do these qualifications usually have a bit Bit more moolah than, <laughs> than FE college libraries so the, are they disadvantaged because of that as they as teachers do they have to talk about that how to access open access resources and the politics behind that so other fun library games that you do um, there's loads. I've put some um, examples underneath, but uh, lesson plans that I've done, I am currently compiling a, a, a list of good lesson plans that I am going to put on my website uh, when I set that up, so you can more have a look at that. I tend to teach information skills and library games in chunks, um, because I've been, I think that that's a better way of teaching than just standing there and lecturing. Um, so things like the SEEK game, that's available open access to the University of Huddersfield repository. Um, sources where you show the range of where you get information from, how the internet is one bit of resources, isn't one bit of resources, pardon me, but a collection of lots of types and sources. Things uh, I, I, that I'm learning at the moment, I've just found out about this, the smell test. This is great, I think, um, in, in maybe using it alongside crap. Well, I don't know who thinks of these names. I, I think they're fabulous. So things like who who wrote it, why did they write it, what evidence is there um, for the thing that they've written, do, do the facts imply the conclusion, is there logic to what they've written, and what's left out. And I think that's something crap doesn't really talk about, is what's left out, what's not being said how if you read newspaper articles that quote from reports um always read the reports because they will probably have been either um selectively or misquoted so i would definitely look at the source material behind what you're reading um these are some classic examples of bad 
bad with little little um, bunny ears around it, bad websites. Um, they're a little bit old and tacky now, but librarians still like them. The dhmo.org is a classic. Um, it's the chemical word for tap water, um, the stuff that you get. And it's a very, very old and tacky looking website that students will instantly write off because no websites look like this anymore. But if, and as an example of why you shouldn't just believe something from the internet, it's a good one. Martin Luther King is a really classic example of why Google is it shouldn't be your first port of call, or if it is, then you should definitely evaluate how you use it and what you use. Um, so if you Google Martin Luther King on the first page, it usually comes up. Some schools have blocked it, as they should do, but, well, it's up to you what you think about that. Um, martinlutherking.org is a website that's written by a group of racists uh, trying to discredit uh, Martin Luther King, who was obviously a very well-respected civil rights leader, but they, they completely discredit it and, and talk a load of rubbish. So those are some classic examples that you might want to have a look at and use, but um, students should also be aware that good websites often have bad material, and it is always best to evaluate everything you use. I like the phrase, question everything. There was a zine that I saw um, reported on in a newspaper, in a, sorry, a journal article recently, Recently, I'm very, very tempted to start my own zine um, on questioning resources and, and why you should just constantly question everything. Um, and again, Googling learning theories, I think, is, is my favourite example that I use with education students. Um, and my final bit of advice would be, please make friends with your librarian. You will reap the rewards if you do, um, but don't depend on them. Library sessions on their own do very little to incentivise students to use scholarly materials. It has to come from you. You are the teacher, you are the tutor, your students trust you. They often don't know the librarians, or if they do, they have bad experiences where when they were at primary school or secondary school and they were naughty, they were sent to the library, which is such bad practice. If you're a teacher, please do not use librarians as babysitters or as punishers. We are not that nasty lady with the bun. We are not there to babysit or discipline your students. Librarians are there to help and facilitate the finding of information. If the use of scholarly sources is tied to grading or other incentives, then library instruction sessions will benefit the students by making the research process and access to scholarly research easier. And that's from um, Howard Nichols, Hayes and Applet from 2014, um, evaluating one-shot library sessions. So library one-shots, inductions, they're great know your librarians, be friends with them, but please, please, please take into account the need for information, good information literacy practices in the classroom, if being able to evaluate information, being able to evaluate where you get it from, um, being able to find um, appropriate information, but also create information appropriately. There are so many information skills, I could go on for days about the importance of this, but what I've done is I've just put some links here. So the um, links to the um, Teen Tech, which is um, supporting materials that were produced by the uh, Information Literacy Group um, from SILIP, who um, have reproduced these materials for young people to think a little bit more about how they use information. Um, Seek, which is one of the games, I'm going to put the link of that underneath. Um, there's also um, some references here for what I've um, referred to in the past. If you are more, in if you are interested, please look them up. Most of them are open access. And also, if you're interested in, in in better searching or privacy when searching, please do check out these these links here. DuckDuckGo is. Um, my new search engine of choice that I found out recently by following librarians on Twitter. Uh, it gives you better privacy when searching. It does not record your searches. Um, every search is fresh, so it's uh, less biased towards your needs and the needs of its advertisers that, that it makes money off. Um, in general, please do think a little bit more about where you get your information from and how you use it. And 